Hi, everybody. Welcome to Osteobites, and thanks for joining us today on your Thursday. My name is Christina Iptoma, and I am mom to Osteo Angel Dillon and director of scientific programs at MIB Agents. And today on Osteobites, we are joined by Dr. Sibyl Mikna from the University College London Cancer Institute. She will discuss the current landscape of PARP inhibitor use in cancers and osteosarcoma, and discuss preclinical evidence and translation of biomarker driven use of therapeutics in osteosarcoma. Thank you so much, Dr. Meeknock, for joining us on Osteobites today. We are thrilled to have you. And also, super happy to always have our panelist, Walker, join us today um, for this webinar. A little bit more about our guest today Dr. Meeknock heads the Laboratory of Cancer Cell Signaling at the University College London Cancer Institute with long-standing interest in concepts that drive tumor development and therapy response in cancer. She acts as a cancer expert for the Royal College of Radiologists and is a founding member of the FOSTER Consortium, which stands for Fighting Osteosarcoma Through European Research Initiative, where she co-leads the cell model and drug response focus groups and is a participant in a newly established initiative, iCure, which aims to establish a living biobank and therapeutics assessment pipeline for rare and ultra rare cancers. Work in the MCNOC team centers on understanding how cell cycle checkpoint aberrations affect the behavior of cancer cells and the identification of therapeutic opportunity that arises therefrom. The team uses functional genomics and chemical biology to discover new treatment paradigms with a current focus on unmet needs in sarcoma and breast cancer and is involved in establishing patient derived and tissue mimetic preclinical cancer models for these cancers in order to accelerate therapeutic discovery. So really looking forward to this discussion today. Um, just a couple of announcements before we get started. Our next virtual tumor review board for osteosarcoma, which we affectionately call Turbo, is uh, next week on May 8th at 5 Eastern. If you are a clinician interested in attending or presenting a case, you can email me at christina at mibagents.org. And we also welcome researchers to this educational forum as it's a really wonderful opportunity to learn about real world clinical challenges. So um, uh, definitely uh, get in touch if you're interested in joining. Um, and registration is filling up really quickly for our Factor Osteosarcoma Conference, which is June 20th to 22nd in Cleveland. So um, save your spot and register soon. I was actually just looking last night and I think we have about 20 more spots until we reach capacity. So if you're planning to attend, I definitely encourage you to register as soon as possible. We um, will have nearly 60 scientific presenters on nine panels this year. Um, we have our patient panel, which is a, a great way to uh, kind of ask a lot of those questions that uh, you'd, uh, you're kind of, Always wanted to know, but we're afraid to ask. Um, we're also gonna have our Outsmarting Osteosarcoma 2024 Research Award presentations. And we have so much fun stuff in between. Um, we have our annual Docs versus Warrior Games that we have at our welcome reception. I think uh, Doctors won the Golden Bone last year, I think, is that right, Walker? Um, so the Warriors are motivated to get it back this year. Um, and our Junior Advisor Board is planning a prom after our Friday dinner. Uh, so it's an enchanted uh, forest theme. And yes, there is gonna be a DJ. Yes, there is gonna be a dancing. And um, prom attire is encouraged, though you are free to wear whatever you want. Um, we also have wellness sessions, including an early morning run with our scientific advisory board chair, Dr. Mateo Truco, an early morning meditation so you can get your day off on the right foot. Um, there is so much good content on our scientific panels this year, but really the magic at Factor happens in all those in-between moments when you're getting a cocktail um, with someone before dinner, when you're chatting with someone at lunch. Um, this year, maybe when you're getting down on the dance floor, who knows? Um, we have clinicians, researchers, scientists, patients, caregivers, advocates, funders, and industry, all with a shared interest and passion in making it better for osteosarcoma patients and the connections and the collaborations that happen um, from us all coming together are pretty incredible. So we hope you can join us this year. Um, Walker, can you please introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, my name is Walker. I'm part of this year's Junior Advisory Board and I've been part of the last couple of Junior Advisory Boards. 
Uh, I've said it the last few weeks, and I'll say it again. Factor really is awesome. I got to go my last factor or my first factor last year, and it was a it really was a great experience and a a great combination of clinicians, researchers, and then patients. Uh, uh, it was unlike anything I've ever gone to experience. So highly recommend doing that. Um, and then I think that's all. So you can take it from there, Doctor Meeknot. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say today. But thank you very much. I will try and share my screen. Let's see how that works. Here we go. And I shall. Oh, that's perfect. I can get the laser to work. Yes. So I'm incredibly pleased to have been invited to um, present at MIB Agents. Um, you know, I've followed many of the seminars that were arranged through through that agency and and I've always been totally you know informed and enlightened I think it's a it's a great platform to, to actually get a really a wide a range of of research in, in in this horrendous disease so um today I will be presenting our work on positioning um poly ADP ribose polymerase inhibitor or PARP inhibitor um for the treatment of um osteosarcoma and I thought um, it'd be very good if I was um, initially starting um, by introducing these inhibitors. Um, so they are a type of um, targeted cancer drug, uh, means we know um, how they kind of work in the cell. Um, and there is known selective toxicity for um, specific kinds of tumors, namely tumors that have specific defects, um, most prominently recognized um, for defects in the uh, homologous recombination uh, DNA repair pathway, often uh, abbreviated with HRD for homologous recombination defect, or also referred to as BRCA ness because mutations in the BRCA genes um, that are um, uh, deleted or have loss of function in a number of cancers, including breast, uh, lead to HRD defect. But there is clearly other defects that for which we haven't got very good biomarkers that also lead to selective um, toxicity. And we know this from preclinical studies, although these um, conditions have not translated really in the clinic because we can't identify cancers that have those. Um, but these inhibitors have become standard of care in cancers with um, HRD. And the next slide. Hmm. The next slide, aha, the next slide relates a little bit um, to, well, explains the mechanism by, by which PARP inhibitors actually um, uh, uh, work in cells and why there is this hypersensitivity in some cancers. Um, actually, these PARP inhibitors take advantage of single strand DNA breaks that need to be repaired in cells. And really, these single strand DNA breaks are a normal event that happened happen very, very abundantly every minute. Um, we're having hundreds and thousands of these breaks generated in our cells, and they need the PARP enzyme to be repaired, and these inhibitors uh, latch onto that PARP enzyme and cement that repair complex um, onto the cellular DNA. And cells can normally actually repair this very well. They don't, they're not terribly bothered. Um, even if the, they are going into a DNA synthesis phase, where a special situation arises where um, the, the replication forks create um, a single-ended double-strand break because they can't go on and replicate any longer. And if you're a normal good body cell, and of course also a part unresponsive cancer cell, you haven't got a big problem with this. You can repair it and you will survive. But if you can't do homologous recombination um, or you have any of these other conditions, then you have a lack of repair. And there's a situation arising that we refer to as synthetic lethality. So the lethality unfolds by having the PARP inhibitor and having this condition. Um, and so there's a high uh, a therapeutic window um, whereby these uh, cancers with this condition are very sensitive and normal, cancer, normal body cells are virtually unaffected. And why really are PARP inhibitors so exciting? They are so exciting because they're really proving their worth in the clinic. They're changing outcome in HRD defective cancers, um, mostly noticed for their uh, value in advanced ovarian cancers, but clearly moving into other cancers that have these HRD defect. This here really sh shows data from a clinical trial, SOLO1, that tested one of those inhibitors in ovarian cancer. 
it was actually its advanced disease, although the patients were rendered disease-free through a standard of care chemo, right? And I'm pointing this out because it helps us think about how to position these inhibitors in other disease. And then they were given for 24 months Olaparib as a maintenance treatment with the intention to prevent metastatic recurrence, right? So we are looking at a maintenance treatment in a disease-free patient that has a high prevalence of developing metastasis. And we can see here that the red curve here really you know, uh, shows a strong benefit of patients treated with Olaparib over the group that was treated with placebo. And these were the five-year data, and we can see that, you know, that differential here is about 25%. And we have now the 2023 seven-year data, and the curve here has actually flattened out. So in these additional uh, two years, there hasn't been any more death um, and any more disease progression in the olaparib treated arm, although these patients have not had olaparib for a very long time, right? It goes flat. And so we are tempted, really tempted to think that this intervention here has been curative for a considerably larger number of patients than we would have been able to cure if we hadn't had that agent. And that uh, really has excited those of us that have sort of a more broader cancer aspect um, it is one of the very exciting drugs that has moved into the clinic. Now, what does that have to do with osteosarcoma? Um, it becomes clear from this work here that we've done, we've done a screen really, and we hadn't been thinking about PARP at all, just PARP inhibitors were part of the agents that were in the library. And that screen really looked for opportunity in cancers that have retinoblastoma tumor suppressor um, loss of function. And that screen had PARP inhibitor, and it was actually Olaparib, for which I had shown you just now the clinical data, as one of the top hits with highly significant functioning in RB defective tumors. And we took a whole range of them from lung to a breast to a glio. And it had also an osteopair because um, RB loss is seen in osteosarcoma. And the, uh, the tumors of a similar histology that didn't have RB involvement were pretty much resistant. So as I have alluded, retinoblastoma protein loss arises in osteosarcoma. And so there may be then a precision opportunity to go for RB mutated tumors. And you can see from this sort of oncoprint version, which is based on mutational data from a single paper, that this won't be all patients, right? That will be a group of patients that have retinoblastoma protein loss, and it would not necessarily be helpful in these other patients. But in these patients, there should be a precision opportunity to place these inhibitors. And to test this, to put an acid test for the, to this, we actually went into an osteosarcoma saline panel Right? So this is a focused panel of 17 osteo-derived cell models. And we asked the question if we treated those with um, a PARP inhibitor, if it could identify for us the RB negative tumors. And it did. It did identify, this is the, the red lines, it, it did identify the, the cell lines that have retinoblastoma protein loss. They were vastly more sensitive compared to the tumors that have normal wild type RB um, constellation. And you can see here um, that the sensitivity actually was higher in these assays than measured for a, a truly BRCA mutated tumor. And it wasn't just true for Olaparib, which is one PARP inhibitor, but it was also true for a second PARP inhibitor, Talazoparib. There's a very significant difference in sensitivity um, of the retinoblastoma mutated group versus the wild type group. Not only is there a difference when we look at natural um, loss of uh, retinoblastoma function in these tumors, but we can cause PARP inhibitor sensitivity by knocking out or causing a retinoblastoma protein loss of function in cell lines, in osteosarcoma cell lines that don't have it. And um, you can see here that we can successfully do this using a little molecular trick, small herpin RNAs. There's three different ones used here, and you can see that the retinoblastoma protein is actually absent when we do that little 
molecular trickery. And when we then look at sensitivity in the red guys, here are the guys again that had the knockout of the retinoblastoma protein. They become vastly more sensitive to olaparib and they also become more sensitive to niraparib here. So it's not just that retinoblastoma pro protein loss correlates, but it is the cause of that increased sensitivity, right? And there's other important data that we gathered. We here looked actually at the um, IC50 inhibitory constant 50 because we wanted to convince ourselves that the sensitivity that we see somehow compares to the sensitivity that we would see in BRCA -ness, right? And we took a BRCA, -ness, a BRCA mutated ovarian cancer cell line, which is here in green, and the IC50 of that cell line is 1.4 micromolar. And you can see that every single one of the cell models that we took along for osteosarcoma is more sensitive using this parameter than the BRCA -ness, truly BRCA, -ness, uh, BRCA mutated CAPAN1. So we thought um, that this is incredibly encouraging that this drug could work just as well in osteosarcoma that has that genetic predisposition as opposed to, as, as it does um, in BRCA mutated cancers. And there's another piece of very important information, or at least it was important to us. We've been working with the cell line panel. They were in culture for a very long time, but we have been able then to get patient derived culture models that had only recently been derived from a tumor sample from a patient and then we got three of them, two were RB normal, and one had RB1 mutation. And you can see here, the RB mutated cell line is vastly more sensitive um, to elaborate and also talazoparib. So it replicates what we had seen in these long established cell lines. And this is, as I said, a cell line that has not seen a long culture and, and relates to a patient that um, has recently, um, ha had recently been um, identified to have osteosarcoma. Um, so I have slotted this slide in here because I am often asked this question, namely um, whether RB loss is just another form of bracha right? Are we looking at just, you know, another gene that could somehow influence HRD? And we have done many experiments, most of them I don't want to show you, that say actually that is not the case. And this here really looks at a biomarker that is a gold standard for identifying PARP inhibitor sensitivity in advanced ovarian cancer, right? And it asks the question, if this marker could one, identify RB negativity um, in, in our cell line panel. And so we are looking at this genomic signature. We have a generated DNA sequence for all of our cell lines. And we are looking at this HRD um, scar, scar score here, and you can see that there is no significant difference between the RB negatives that are sensitive to the drug and the RB positives that are not sensitive. So SCAR HRD, which is a strategy that we can use to identify brackenness, does not identify these very sensitive um, cancers. And we can ask that question even more um, uh, pointedly, namely whether um, we can in identify PARP inhibitor sensitivity that we have measured in that cell line panel, not um, scoring for RB um, at all. Um, and here you can see that there's no significant difference using that HRD SCAR score between the sensitive and the resistant cell lines, looking at two different PARP inhibitors. So what that says is that that biomarker here cannot be used to identify the RB uh, defective sensitive patients in the clinic for osteo or any other cancer, um, and also that it is very unlikely that what we are seeing here, that sensitivity, is really related to uh, the term brackerness, right? So now I would like to switch gear a little bit and talk about the current clinical use of PARP inhibitors and that it is actually a matter of correct positioning. You have already seen this graph here, where we're getting this quite astounding uh, response rate and success um, in ovarian cancer patients that were disease-free, that had advanced disease, but that had received chemo. And so this is a first line setting where olaparib was given right after that initial treatment of those patients. 
in a second trial, SOLO2, that PARP inhibitor, that same PARP inhibitor, Olaparib, was moved into a patient population that had actually relapsed and had recurrent disease. And you can see here that there was actually not, nowhere near or, or actually no significant success that compared to the success here. So once patients had relapsed and recurred after multiple lines of treatment, that inhibitor wasn't actually valuable. It's used, the use wasn't valuable anymore. And of course, that means something for the treatment of osteosarcoma, right? There's desperate situations in osteosarcoma where cancer has reoccurred after, and has not been uh, responding to multiple lines of treatment. And we are all agreeing that we really, really need solutions here. But I think that the clinical information that we have on PARP inhibitors argues that this is not where we should be positioning it and we should not expect benefit in this patient group. But where we should actually position it is in a first line setting in early disease where we have treated this disease with, with adjuvant chemotherapy as we do now with surgery and has have generated a disease-free situation. And that in this situation, if it was replicating the Brachanus example in ovarian cancer, we would expect benefit. So we are talking about high-grade OS, but that has not metastasized, but has been treated um, first line after chemo. And we may consider high-grade OS that may have metastasized, but responded to chemo. Um, and so in these patients, if the, there is predictions to be made from the current clinical use, that is where we should expect benefit. And there's, of course, burning questions that we had when we were at that stage. And this work is now um, actually funded by Bone Cancer Research Trust. And we have a, a good and very generous amount of funding to try and to have this, this, this observation be moved forward into clinical use. And the first burning question actually is how to identify patients with RB1 defect. And I've argued with you that HRD scar scores that we are currently using in Brachanus will not work, right? And we need to learn something about these patients, right? We have no idea about the presentation, prognosis, and prevalence of patients that have RB defective disease, right? We don't know whether they're doing particularly well or particularly badly. And of course, you know, because it's a different mechanism, we need to think about resistance markers and potentially also companion drugs and how we can um, use this drug in combination and in uh, succession with um, um, currently used standard of care. Now, I have put this slide in also in you because I want to make you aware that, of course, PAP inhibitors are used in um, pediatric cancers, including osteosarcoma. But there was two things that I want to point out. One, they're used actually in refractory and recurrent disease which I have just argued may well not show as benefit that these drugs can, can actually deliver, although they are used in a maintenance and expected maintenance setting. Um, what I should point out is also that there is biomarkers used to identify patients and the trials are called match for molecular analysis for a therapy choice. And the genes that this trial looks for are genes that classically cause brachiness. It's BRCA1 and 2 mutations, but it's also a number of other mutations. And so we were very curious to see if these mutations would actually identify RB negative disease. Maybe HRD score is no good, but maybe these mutations would. And here you can see an oncoprint format of c portal deposited osteosarcoma data. This is a, a multi-study um, data collection of quite a lot of osteosarcoma data. And here, we have the RB negative cases is about 15% estimated by this genomic strategy. And we can see that um, the uh, del deleterious loss of these genes actually arises in cancers. They can be seen, they're rare, but they're arising in cancers that actually have normal RB. So in these trials here, we are treating patients that may well have a good chance to respond by the fact that they're of course in a disease state where this um, a drug hasn't delivered. Um, but we are actually not looking at RB deleted disease. And so these patients here um, are not included um, in these trials, right? So how 
would we want to identify RB loss to be able to, you know, include these patients um, into clinical trials? And there, of course, is genomics. Um, but genomics is very difficult with retinoblastoma protein because it's a very, very large locus. Um, and um, it, retinoblastoma protein can be lost by many, many different types of mutations, including splice, promoter mutations, and methylations. And so the genomic gives us quite a high false negative and also some false positive rate um, of, of, of gene loss. Um, it is also quite slow and expensive, and it requires quite a high level of material that often cannot be obtained um, from um, biopsy material in osteo. So we have opted with money from Bone Cancer Research Trust to see if we could get an immune histology strategy to work, which has some false negative and positive um, uh, calls, but that can be quite well managed um, by using correct strategies. It is fast and cheap, and the material required is very minimal. It really needs a slice of tumor that is harvested anyways for routine diagnosis and it delivers what we call spatial information. We could actually say whether one end of the tumor was RB defective and another end was RB normal. And we thought that was perhaps quite important. And here is first evidence that we can get this really to work. And um, uh, the strategy that we have developed uses two different RB antibodies, mostly to limit false positivity. And we are looking here at tumors that have varied RB status by genomics, here's two wild type tumors, and you can see that the RB antibody stains quite well. Sorry. Oops. Um, here's the two mutant tumors, and we can see that that staining is much reduced. You can see some staining here, but that relates very likely to normal cells that are sitting within the tumor environment. We've also looked at a, a, a correlation from um, a, a M mRNA data and we found that there's a very strong positive relationship between expression of these INC4A um, uh, CDK cycling dependent kinase inhibitor and the RB loss. So this is not expressed when we have a wild type RB, but this can be expressed and, is, and expression is permissible in tumors when we have RB mutation. And this relationship with INC4A and RB is actually known from other mutated tumors. And here you can see that if you use an antibody, you don't have to just rely on loss, which is always a very difficult thing. You could have a sample that somehow was spoiled. But here you can see that you get very strong staining with that marker, and you don't get any staining when you have wild type RB. So having these three different antibodies that can, can report on RB status, we feel pretty safe that we can well identify, genetically identified uh, tumors um, that have mutated RB. So we have learned some lessons with it. One is that it might well be that RB loss is more frequent um, than estimated from genomics. And again, it's not a terrible surprise because as I said to you, Often, in, in a number of cases, in other RB-mutated tumors, RB loss is caused by promoter methylation, and you wouldn't pick that up with no normal genome sequencing. So there is much hope that it could actually be applying to nearly 50% of all osteosarcomas. But there's important next steps that we have to do, and that is that we have to gather data on patient characteristics. And I had already referred to you that this has to do with outcome, presentation at diagnosis. We would like to know whether these patients respond to chemo or not. And we would love to use real world data. We can glean at this problem by looking at um, tumor genomics data that may miss some RB mutated. And when we look at these data and they're very sparse, the outcome data are very sparse here. There's very few tumors for which there's useful outcome data. It looks as though RB mutated cancers could do a little bit worse, but that is not significantly different from um, unaltered tumors. But what we should say is that virtually all these data that we see in these depositories are enriched for patients with poor outcome. I believe that we really, really need to look at patients that come into the clinic that are real world in order to get a realistic view 
as to what these patients actually present with at the outset. And of course, that is important if we wanted to plan proper positioning and we would like to use immune histochemistry. And there's something in red here that if in the audience somebody knows and has contact of people who could help us with this, we want to look at a lot of tumors. And if, if, if these tumors were available, linked to very good outcome data, and if we could actually form links and we could work together on this, we would very, very much welcome this. Right, so this is actually getting me to the end um, of my presentation. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about companion strategies, mostly because they are relevant actually to um, current use of uh, PARP inhibitors in osteosarcoma in the clinic, but also because companion targets often are linked to improved efficacy and also often enables targets on, and, and medicines to be uh, moved into conditions that have a higher disease burden and in, into patients that are um, currently in, in greater um, uh, unmet uh, medical needs situations. And one thing that we've looked at that really is in clinical trials is whether inhibition of ATR, which is an enzyme that responds to the trapped PARP that causes the problem, right? And that gives a survival advantage in that context, whether inhibition of that enzyme could give us a companion um, help with sensitivity. And when we ran this in RB mutant PARP inhibitor sensitive, sensitive cell lines, that worked really well. These things here are called excess above bliss plots. And when you see this kind of mountain here, it tells you that adding this other inhibitor makes the PARP inhibitor a lot better. It synergizes. It's not just additive, but it synergizes. And we saw that for two of these ATR inhibitors, right? But when we then looked into PARP inhibitor resistance cell lines, we found that this ATR inhibition actually makes also these cancer suddenly sensitive. You might think this is a good thing. It might actually expand us using these inhibitors in initially resistant cancers, but we have now evidence that that also applies to normal cells. And so what this infers to us, and that's why we are a little um, sort of um, cautious here, that probably this strategy is not enhancing the therapeutic window. It doesn't make it more cancer selective. That but that what that we, we are getting an um, enhanced sensitivity, but that probably also translates into enhanced toxicity and that, that may this strategy may not be suitable to do a maintenance treatment over extended periods. But this this slide, this side of the slide um, relates to some really um, new data. Um, again, um, there is published evidence that PARP inhibitors actually can do cause a type of DNA damage in sensitive cells that leads to a pathway activation via these two uh, players here, Sting and IRF3, that lead to an increased immune re uh, recruitment. So this, this pathway here leads to secretion of molecules that call the immune response in. And you might be quite aware that um, immune uh, uh, targeting of cancers has shown uh, incredible benefit um, in many uh, 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 adult and many, many, many uh, uh, frequent cancers. Um, in osteosarcoma, there is real, a real issue with immune recruitment. These cancers are quite immune cold, but talazoprate activates, uh, or PARP inhibitors, talazoprate used here, activates that pathway, and we can see this by looking at these molecules here. And so there may be a possibility really to devise a companion strategy using PARP inhibitors together with immune enhancing and immune targeting strategies. This is very new. We're just working and we are looking downstream whether this really happens here and if we can get an um, immune attack in preclinical models. I just thought I did want to share this with you because we are quite excited about it. So this is a summary slide um, to just remind you what um, I told you about. Um, we have quite comprehensive preclinical evidence suggesting that PARP inhibitor sensitivity arises in RB-mutated osteosarcoma. 
Um, I've told you that we think that RB mutated osteosarcoma are not identified by current criteria that are used to identify sensitivity um, and are not included using these criteria in current PARP inhibitor osteosarcoma trials. So we want these patients to be included, but the criteria that are currently used are not sufficient to identify um, these cancers. I have tried to um, relay to you that I believe personally that positioning of PARP inhibitors in the clinic in osteosarcoma um, matters, right? The clinical experience from cancers that uh, have a standard of care a PARP inhibitor use argues very strongly that these inhibitors need to be positioned early in the disease. And whether this is feasible and how this is feasible in osteosarcoma needs to be discussed um, uh, by the clinicians. And I've spoken a little bit about our work on companion targets with some early evidence that there could be uh, an interaction with um, immune approaches. And this is really the last slide that I'd want to show, really just as a um, sort of um, a, a thought, um, a food for thought, um, a slide. You know, we have identified PARP inhibitors in a screen where we used a, a panel that, that represented a certain uh, genetic defect um, uh, over uh, uh, cancers that, that didn't have it, and we identified PARP inhibitors. The question really is, could we look further? Should we expand um, the therapeutics that we are testing, and would there be more that we could find in RB defective disease in osteosarcoma that's RB defective? And could we maybe find something for other um, uh, uh, groups of osteosarcoma for which PARP inhibitors, of course, wouldn't be a solution. And with this, I would like to thank you for listening. Um, I am greatly um, grateful for the funding that we have received um, for this work, which initially came from Cancer Research UK, was picked up by children with cancer, and now is very generously reported, but supported by Bone Cancer Research Trust. Um, these are the members um, of my team that were involved um, in the work. Um, we are doing this work at the UCL Cancer Institute, and here are collaborators, amongst them uh, Dr. Nishlan Pillai and, their, and um, his team that have been entirely um, instrumental in um, helping us achieve what we have achieved in this work. And I would be totally delighted to receive some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Meeknock, for breaking that down for us, because I think, you know, we've probably heard of PARP inhibitors also just because of its you know, use in, in breast cancer and stuff, and it's an FDA approved drug. But I think this kind of really gives us a nice picture of relevance to osteosarcoma. Um, and anyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to put that in the Q&A and we will grab those um, and share those with Dr. Meeknock. But I might just start off, I thought that was so interesting about what you were saying, because I mean, my question was kind of like prevalence of RB1 loss in osteosarcoma. And what you were saying about, um, I think the number you threw out, at least from the data that we have to date, like in see Bioporta was like 15%, but that it might be very underreported because of the false negatives um, in, in the current kind of a uh, genomic sequencing. So I just wanted to clarify. So like current data that we have looks, is it 15%, but we think it could be as high as 50%? Yes. So it, it, the genomics under reports and that, that is sort of in RB, a very severe underreporting because it's a very GC rich locus where sequencing actually falters. The promoter is often very poorly covered where a lot of mutations sit. Um, a lot of mutations reside in, um, in splice junctions that are not well covered unless you do whole genome sequencing. And a lot of the data sets that we currently have, the genomic data sets, are not based on whole genome sequencing. And then there is that phenomenon of promoter methylation that can be used to silence genes, right? And we know from situations where RB loss is very well studied, that is a retinoblastoma eye cancer, that about 20% of uh, cases where RB loss is um, observed in that disease come from promoter methylation. And from our limited um, observations based on immune histochemistry, we do agree that there is more uh, cancers that seem to not stain for RB um, than are identified by current by the by 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 genomic strategies. So 
um, we, we, we need to stay more conscious to get a correct number. And um, as I said, we, we really need to go into real world uh, cancer collections um, to make sure that we're not just looking at you know, poor outcome cancers, but that we are looking at the breadth of patients that present in the clinic. So um, I, I want to be somewhat careful, but I think that, you know, our assumption that it is, we, it is, it is more than the 15% or 18% that are currently identified by genomic strategies is, 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 is likely accurate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Can I ask you, sorry to flip back to some of your slides. I was, you had the one slide early on. It was, I think it was the Oncoprint slide. It had the grid with kind of all the different mutations and it kind of showed RB1 loss uh, yeah. with P53 and then P53. I was just curious. So I think going back and looking at that, it looks like RB1 loss happens, is kind of commonly in tandem with P53 mutation. Yes. Correct. Uh, and I'm wondering, because, you know, the, it's cancer is so confusing, right? Because there are so many um, uh, combinations and de different dependencies. And, you know, if something you kind of plug one hole, like it finds another way. And I'm wondering if there is any difference in PARP inhibitor sensitivity, depending on what RB1 loss is combined with. So like RB1 loss alone versus RB1 loss with P53 mutation, or or I don't know, like RB1 looks like it will happen occasionally with HRX um, loss as well. So are there any, how does that affect, if there, if there are mutations in other genes, how does it affect PARP sensitivity? So the truth of, the, the true answer is that we cannot be sure that there isn't a combinatorial effect. Um, from our cell line panel data, we have such a very, very high um, correlation of RB loss with uh, PARP inhibitor sensitivity that we think it is very likely the only determinant. And then of course, we have the causality measure, right? We have taken, of course, we might have been lucky, but we've done it actually in, in, in two different cancers. We may have luckily picked a cancer that has that other sort of genetic um, aberration as well, but we can just take RB away from a totally resistant cancer cell line, osteosarcoma cell line, and we are generating sensitivity. So it, 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 it shows that RB loss is a key determinant and that it works in an unselected random background. We could have been unlucky and we would have picked, you know, something that is a mitigating event, right? But our current view is that it is unlikely that there is another parameter that co-determines sensitivity. We will need to look at more tumors and we will look, need to look at more patient-derived samples and perhaps go into more models that are more near um, to the clinic in order to, to, to get total confidence. And of course, clinical trials, hopefully, if we do get them working, um, will uh, give insight into this. Um, I don't know whether that answers the question tentatively. Yes, yes, it does. Um, and Walker, I think you might have had a couple questions. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, one of my questions is, um, so I know you talked about the fact that the, the regular DNA does uh, normal, uh, like homologous DNA repair. So I guess my question is, what what's the harm or what would be the harm in, in adding this like a frontline MAP chemotherapy? Because uh it doesn't seem like there's really any side effects to it uh, like adding the the parp inhibitor to the to the frontline treatment uh, or is that being tested i guess no it isn't tested no frontline hasn't been tested and, and early tumors hasn't been tested but as you can see from this here we would be over treating a large number of patients right giving it to everyone now as you can also appreciate it is a 24 months you know schedule currently and there is discussion whether this is the right way whether one should extend it whether you could give drug holiday there are side effects the vast majority isn't serious and manageable it's it's um um it, it's some hematological issue that you know can be managed quite well by giving a, a bit of drug holidays um there there is uh, a, a, a 
loss of appetite and sort of some GI effects that that patients get uh, suffer. Um, so the, the 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 side effect there are side effects, and they're not um, a, 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 a not critical life threatening in in most um, situations. Um, but it is not as though you were just um, eating, you know, a, a pile of sweets. So uh, it has to be considered in that context that we are giving a drug. Um, and of course, you know, um, you might actually make lead to cancer evolution in um, when 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 it doesn't work. That might then not respond to other other treatments. So I think it you would be well advised um, to to really go for patients that 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 benefit. Um, from that treatment by the fact that, of course, it has to also be affordable, right? So it has to be paid for and uh, giving a drug to patients that wouldn't benefit, um, uh, you know, would, would not help help out there with treatment yeah. costs. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I guess kind of going along with that same idea, so you talked about the, the ATR inhibitor and the combination of that with the PARP inhibitor. So you said that there could be some, some pretty serious side effects with that. Um, could the would the body be able to handle that though? Like, let's say that treatment was extremely effective, uh, would would it make sense to maybe still do that? So there is a clinical trial that was cited on that slide where PARP inhibitor is used together with ATR inhibitor. It is an end stage disease, and their outcome isn't clear, but the toxicity seems to be be substantive, right? Um, so this is hematological tox. Um, this is other uh, sort of probably liver toxicity. You have digestive, anything that would would divide in your body would actually be quite affected by that treatment. It is in clinical trials, and we will have to wait to see if it if it gives efficacy. It is not biomarker driven. So in that trial, patients are treated that would have. PARP inhibitor sensitivity and patients that wouldn't have PARP inhibitor sensitivity. Our data say that you are shifting sensitivity on both arms, but that the differential still is maintained. So even in that trial, it would be of advantage to have a close look at the RB defective patients and if they in particular benefit from the treatment. And that trial might actually give us real world answers to the question that you asked is this a viable strategy in late stage cancers? It probably wouldn't be a viable strategy as a maintenance treatment, but in recurrent disease, it could well be. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Meeknath, I had another question. You had that slide that had the, um, I think it was in um, ovarian, but comparing the, uh, you know, using the elaborib, um, yeah, that one. This one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. First of all, that was, I think that's so interesting. So basically treatment was just for 24 months or yes. in this one. Oh, as if, as opposed to okay, on the right side, it was treatment until progression. Yeah. But like, so the, the, the progression of these patients actually arose or arises within 24 months in, in quite a lot of the cases. Right. But it was actually treated until progression, but it had no benefit. Um, for the patients. Right, because um, that was after or, they treated with over three different treatments. Yeah, and so these are these are not disease-free patients. They have tumor mass, and it shows that that inhibitor isn't strong enough um, to actually combat that situation. And in many ways, when, we, when I think as a biologist about this situation here, what this smacks off and, and, and seems to indicate is that we are giving this drug to patients that haven't got disease, but they may have micrometastasis that are dormant, but they're over this period waking up. And as they're waking up and becoming proliferative active, they get a hit on their head. And so what we are doing here is we are preventing metastatic progression. And through this, we are allowing these patients to be cured, right? We are not actually curing primary disease. Primary disease is cured by the chemo and by the, the primary treatment. In osteo, that would be, um, you know, surgery and that would be uh, adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy, right? A chemo. And after that, we would try and prevent patients from to come back with that disease in a metastatic setting. And that is probably 
what we are seeing here, right? Metastasis can't develop, but once they have developed and they, they have a tumor mass, then that inhibitor can actually not, not, not pull its weight any longer and cannot not provide benefit. Mm -hmm. um, so on the, the group on the left, the, the, that they were treated with first line um, while disease free. So, you know, minimal disease burden, potentially mm -hmm. microphotic disease. Um, do, is there any understanding of um, for patients that did um, did not have any disease progression within those twenty four months versus those that did to understand like any resistance mechanisms? Up, 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 absolutely, yes. There is there is resistance. Um, uh, there's hunt for resistance, and there is a number of genes that are known to relate to this resistance. Amongst them is actually. And the regain of uh, of of HRD through um, a loss of a of a negative regulator and through back mutation of BRCA, yeah. So the the BRCA gene is repaired or methylation is is reversed, and so suddenly you get BRCA expression, and these 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 tumors become HRD competent. We have looked for the known resistant factors both biochemically and also in genome data sets. And we find that in untreated osteo, in RB negative disease, we do not see these resistance factors existing, pre-existing. And we are of the view that these same resistance will not lead to resistance in RB negative disease, all right? We haven't tested every single one of these resistance markers, but we have tested the, the, the major ones. So what causes resistance here would not cause resistance in RB negative disease, but be assured there will be ways around it, right? Cancers find ways around it, and we will need to understand resistance spectra in the RB negative background. But I'm pretty, our data say we can be pretty sure that the resistance genes will be different from the genes that have been identified in brachiness. Okay, so got it's it. important work that has to be done um, because, you know, you don't want to start treating patients that have, you know, uh, at the outset already resistance, or at least you want to know about it. Just on the flip real quick, though, like for, so it's interesting in this case, again, that treatment, they, they got it for 24 months as opposed to just until there was progression. I mean, is there anyone on the study who might have progressed after stopping the drug who <laughs> benefited from prolonged use yes the drug? You can see this these patients here they progress after the drug was stopped and there's much discussion over whether this should be extended there's also discussion if you do need it actually every single day and week could we give patients a month that inhibitor and then let them go for a month Right, because they may be, you know, losing weight and not having no appetite and that. And would that be totally sufficient? Because if the mechanism really is to mop up the occasional metastasis that manages to, to proliferate, we might not need a contiguous schedule. And basically those reductions that were necessary in these patients sometimes, because you know, the, the hematological parameters weren't good, have actually not significantly challenged the, 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 the ability of these inhibitors to work. So this is probably a very dense schedule that's not necessary. And extending the schedule would probably be of benefit in this disease. How this would pan out for osteo, we will need to see. Mm -hmm. Right, but you. The question is a very good one. Yeah, where does the twenty-four months come from? It basically caught patients that would have normally progressed. You can see that's when they really progress, right? And that's what you wanted to actually see if that could be stopped. And then it turns out this actually flattens out, right? So that the seven-year data show that this curve has not dropped. And when you see that. You know, this means kind of that we are not having additional deaths, right? These patients live for another. These are these patients may be cured. Yeah. Right. We're very careful with that word because it's such a big word, and we also long for saying it. But yeah, yeah. but that flat line is is nice. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah.
There's a, there, there's a question that came into the Q&A. They asked, uh, is there a difference in biological behavior between patients whose tumors are RB deleted versus RB mutated versus RB inactivated? Uh, for example, due to alterations of other proteins upstream or downstream in the pathways of chromatin organization and transcriptional control that are regulated by RB. So, I mean, RB loss has a very broad range of biological effects in tissue culture models, right? Um, including, you know, mitotic calamities, um, loss of chromatin, chromatin condensation because uh, RB is a chromatin regulator, right? It leads to chromatin condensation when it sits on the DNA. And so there's broad biochemistry, broad biology that links to retinoblastoma protein loss that goes beyond its transcriptional roles in controlling um, cell cycle progression, right? So that's that's its main job in uh, allowing cells to go into the proliferative cycle or not. But if you haven't got it, your genome gets very de de deranged and disorganized and mitosis becomes a problem and all of those things. And it is more likely that by these events, it drives cancer than by its transcriptional role in controlling um, cell cycle. So it's a hit and run mechanism that causes mitotic calamity. Um, calamity when, when cells divide, right? In genomic instability. So I'm not sure whether that answered the question because, you know, we, as far as, you know, patient behavior goes in osteosarcoma, we don't know whether there is a difference between patients that lose retinoblastoma protein and patients that are wild type for that factor. But it is something that we, we really should try and find out, right? It could well be that the presentation and progression and all of this is very similar. It could also be that the RB, that patients that have RB loss do better. We don't have data at the moment to be sure and to be confident that we can draw a conclusion here. So could that could that be to like any environmental factors or would it all be more biological? Well, we would think that if it correlates with genetics, it would be all molecular, right? Yeah. yeah. But, you know, one has to be careful because patients might be later diagnosed, patients might be early. So it you need to look at a, a, an awful lot more tumors than you think in order to actually get clean data. And you mustn't bias your selection uh, towards tumors that do particularly badly, right? We, we need to have all patients that come to the clinic observed for, for that molecular change. Or, and that's what uh, we like to achieve. And just in your your clinic alone, would you be able to get the numbers, or would it would you have to collaborate with with other people to be able to make that happen? To get we the need collaborators. We need yeah. big time collaborators, and we need people that that see these patients and have these samples to to agree that we could that we could stain them, or they would stain them using the strategy we have, right? And it it is actually cheap and quick. So and it needs very little material, but it isn't an established strategy that could be used currently um, for, for clinical decision making, we just want to extract the data alongside clinical presentation. And we wouldn't need long term, we want to just know how these patients are observed when they come to the clinic, have they already got metastasis or not? Or does the majority have or not? And, and do they respond to, to, to standard of care treatment? Can we make them disease free? Or are they the ones that are really, you know, the, 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 the non-responders, right? So we, we, we don't know that at the moment, but that could be quite easily established if we had enough tumors. So yeah, we are, we are, we are on a drive to see who, who would work with us to, to do this, to look at this. Gotcha. Well, hopefully, more people, hopefully more people join in. Yeah, exactly. I was gonna say, we're happy to share. We can share your contact information, Dr. McNock in our follow up with our attendees. Yeah, that would be great. I mean, having, you know, people in America, you know, participate would would be really good. So the Europeans are coming on board and we have we're having links here through um, activities that we have here Europe wide, but um, we haven't currently, you know, approached and, and heard from anyone in the States if they could could help us or if they could participate um, in any way. Um, yeah, that'd be great.
Yeah. And, um, and as you mentioned, there is that active clinical trial right now with the uh, Olaparib and Theralaceratib. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of that as well. Um, yeah. Any data and from that? Yep. Um, well, thank you so much, Dr. McNaught, for this super uh, informative hour and again for kind of explaining RB1 loss and PARP uh, sensitivity to us, PARP inhibitor sensitivity to us. Um, really interesting. And we are so grateful to you for um, joining us today and for making it better for sarcoma patients and pediatric osteosarcoma patients. More information on this and all osteobites can be found on our website at mibagents.org, on our YouTube channel. And um, you can also find uh, this on your favorite podcast place. Um, I hope you can come back and join us next week on Osteobites on May 9th. We are going to be joined by Dr. Amy LeBlanc from the NCI. She's going to provide updates on the NCI DOG2 project and discuss genomic and transcriptional profiling of canine osteosarcoma and how the results relate to human osteosarcoma. You can find our Osteobites lineup for the next few months on our website. And if you have ideas for future topics that you'd like to hear about, please feel free to email us at events at mibagents.org. Thank you again, Dr. Meeknock, for joining us, especially late in the evening uh, in London, and Walker for spending an hour with us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us. We hope to see you back here next week on the 9th when we talk to Dr. LeBlanc. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Dr. Meeknock. Thank you, Walker. Thank you.